Well, I want somebody to go ahead and take your hands. I want you to do what Brother Srillo has been asking us to do. I want you to look into your hands as we welcome you to day six of the life-changing proof producers. What must we do that we might work the works of God? School of ministry. I want you to look in those hands. I want you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, even through the mouth of Brother Srillo saying the secret to the healing, to the future success of the gospel of Jesus Christ touching this world lies in the hands of the person that finds the answer to the question, what must we do that we might work the works of God? I wanna congratulate you today. Honey, I'm so glad that you are here God is using your life. God is using your life who is watching today as never before because it's not the work of a man, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Brother Sol has been teaching us that God is not depending on anything we possess. The greatest power we have is the power to surrender. That's what Brother Srila was telling us yesterday. Today's message, we're gonna go right into it. I love it. What happened to the early church must happen to us. You think about it for a second. The early church had none of the technology that we have, but church history tells us that in the first several centuries after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, for all intents and purposes, the entire world was reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now here we are on Facebook, YouTube, podcast, mega churches, television, airplanes, the printed word in the Bible, in books, podcasts, cassettes, you name it. And maybe half of the world's population has never one time heard the name of Jesus Christ. Brother Srila would always say, we are in a race against time. But I love the statement that he would make. He would say, maybe the early church had something that we don't have. Well, today we are going to discover a few of the most important things that the early church had that caused them to operate in this incredible power this incredible anointing of God. So if you are ready, and I'm so thankful that you are here today, I'm so thankful that you're connecting. Tomorrow will be the incredible closing, anointing and impartation service. I cannot wait, but here we are. Day six, Proof Producers School of Ministry. What must we do that we might work the works of God? I want us to give honor to whom honor is due. Let's welcome once again, God's servant, Dr. Morris Cirillo. How many of you like to walk down the street corner, brother, and get a few hundred people on a street say? All right, I'm not talking about the ruts of the harvest. How am I talking about spiritual, conventional Christianity. I'm talking about laying hold onto a spiritual breakthrough that enabled the early church to take the world. You say, oh, Brother Sula, that's all right. That was Jesus. Jesus had 5,000 converts. He was the son of God. Go to the third chapter in your heart of the book of Acts. And what do you find? You find a man, Peter, come staggering out of an upper room. He walks by a synagogue where he went by day after day after day. And 
and outside was a man lame from his mother's womb and every day he'd turn his face in shame because he couldn't do anything but drop a little bit of a coin inside that man's cup. Now I wonder how many crippled people you've ever passed by on the street corner and wished in your heart that you could do something more than just show a little bit of sympathy. It's, it's going to happen. I said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. This time, Peter didn't have to turn his face away in sympathy. But he walked right up to that lame man. He said, silver and gold have I none. I wish I could give you a lot of money, but I don't have any to give you. But he said, I just got something that money can't buy. It wasn't one goose bump on top of another, and it wasn't a little Jake and dance and jingle and running up and down the aisles of the church. But he said, I just got something. He said, I was submerged. I was baptized. I got the spirit without measure. Now he said, give me those hands. 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 And he took him by the hand and he raised him up on his feet. The crippled man leaped and jumped for joy, tore up the whole synagogue, broke up all the worship. <laughs> Brother, you, 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 com you compare that, if you will, to how we want to sit so nice and calm and reserved <laughs> in the churches. And oh, everything's got to be decent and in order, brother. I never found one thing in order where Jesus was ministering, brother, and where the disciples ministered. They turned the place upside down, inside out. <laughs> could use it. A lot of us could use it. A little shaking upside down, inside out. But remember, God's got a purpose. God's got a purpose. God's got a purpose. Remember the purpose why Jesus came. First John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Miracles don't happen just for miracles sake. Miracles happen to show and to prove that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he came here to defeat and to destroy the works of the devil. Look what happened to Peter. One genuine miracle. It tore the synagogue upside down, inside out, and the word spread out on the street, brother, and the whole city came together outside the temple. What are you wasting time on? This little fisherman 
who never was to Bible school, didn't go to a theological seminary, but had an experience. He stood up and he talked to that whole city until the Bible says in Acts 4, 4, what happened? 5,000 men stood outside and said, yes, Peter, we believe Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Do you know, Peter wasn't always like this. <laughs> Neither was John, because Peter and John stood together on this miracle. How many of you know what Peter did when Jesus was being tried? What did all the disciples do when Jesus would go off and pray? Where was Peter at the cross? Running, scared, doubting, fearful, not only for his own life, but because he didn't understand what was taking place. And where was Peter at the resurrection? In fact, where was any disciple at the resurrection? Now, this was the same man who was standing at the gate picking up the cripple. He was the same man physically. But believe me, brother, he was not the same man inside. Something happened to him. And listen to me. I love you. Listen to me. Listen to me. What happened to Peter and what happened to those disciples has got to happen to us. Amen. They were changed from fearful, doubting, running, hiding, Fleeing, scared, backboneless, wishy washy, denying disciples of Jesus to men who eventually gave their life in death. The 16th chapter of the book of Mark, where we went through a great experience where we learn that it is not what we are or what we possess, but what God can make of us. And if you remember, we left off where Jesus appeared unto the eleven, these disciples that did not believe in the resurrection, and he rebuked them and he upbraided them in their heart for their unbelief, their hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And then, do you remember what the Lord did? How many of you remember what the Lord did right after that yesterday? That's right. He gave them the great commission. He said, go ye into all the world. We concluded 
that if we were looking for a group of preachers or ministers that we would have never chosen this lot. Because they were really truly failures. But Jesus was not looking at what they were or how much they had failed. But he was looking at what he can make of them. And God's not looking at your personality. Now I want to answer this question. The commission Jesus gave them was this. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Now I have been teaching you. The Holy Spirit has been teaching you here. That we will never reach the world through great preachers. That's not to minimize them. Or great preaching or silver tongue oratory. But when I say that, I don't use that in a degrading way. I only use that to bring into perspective that we have had the greatest preachers in the world for hundreds of years. And still today, half the world has never yet one time heard the name Jesus. Something is wrong. Great preaching alone cannot do it. Now, what does it mean to preach the gospel? Somebody said, or what is the gospel? Somebody said it's the good news. Well, that's part of it. Somebody said it's the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. Well, that's part of it. You say, Brother Sunil, that doesn't impress you very much. No, it doesn't. I know you've got that look of shock on your face again. Did you know that Jesus Christ was not the only one who died on the cross? Come on, you can smile at me. There were thousands of people who died on crosses during the days of Christ. That was the way that they penalized crooks and murderers. They killed them on crosses. But there was no virtue in the cross. Piece of wood. But the virtue was in the person who was on the cross. I've said to you several times in the past several days, it is easy for us to preach today. How many of you heard me say that? Let me tie that knot. Do you know why? Because we don't have to prove anything. One of the easiest professions in the world is to be a preacher. Just walk into the pulpit, you get a nice little sermon, you know, cooked up for Sunday morning. It's not hard to be a preacher today, you know why? Because you can get up and preach on almost anything and don't have to prove it. See, today, we don't have to prove anything. We just go behind the sacred desk. We open the Bible. We get a few scriptures. We get a first point, second point, third point. We teach. We preach. We shake hands. Our kids grow up, follow us in the line of the church. The church grows from generation to generation as children inherit their mother and father's religion, and we make a few converts. The task that confronted the early church and the apostles was this. You prove to the world that that man called Jesus, who everybody rubbed shoulders against and touched and felt his flesh, which was human. What did Jesus do when Jesus got hungry? What 
did he do when he got tired? What did he do when he got thirsty? Now you tell me how you're going to convince a world that this person in the flesh is God. You know why the early church reached the then known world in the first and second century? was because they stayed true to their task. And their task was to convince the world that Jesus was not like any other God, but that he was alive. The first, the first sermon that Peter preached when he staggered down that street and lifted that crippled man and overthrew the entire worship in the synagogue. And the people looked at him and what did Peter say? He stood up and he said, don't look at me as if I made this man whole. He said, Jesus Christ of Nazareth healed him. Yeah. And brother, listen to me. The whole crowd in the, in the synagogue roared and the priest led them and said what do you mean Jesus of Nazareth Jesus is dead we killed him we saw him buried in the grave Peter said you didn't let me finish I said by faith in the name of Jesus of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead Produce the proof. They produce the proof. They produce the proof. How do we get so far from our task? How do we get more interested in gymnasiums, swimming meets, baseball clubs? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of those things. But I told you, we got to set some orders of priorities. If this is where it's at, brother, to reach the world, then why is the church spending so much time on everything else in its program that doesn't produce it? Let's talk about their method. Do you understand what I'm talking about? How many of you know why it's easier to preach today than it was 2,000 years ago? So you couldn't just get up and preach that Jesus is the Son of God 2,000 years ago. You know why? Because you were preaching to people that walked with him. You were preaching to people that actually talked to him. You were preaching to people, brother, that ate with him and slept with him. And they're going to say to you, okay, you say Jesus is Lord, prove it. You want me to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he wasn't a man when I touched him and I felt him? You want me to believe that he was the Word? See, you know what the task of that early church was? It was not only to just preach and to convince the world that Jesus Christ was Lord, but hold on to your seat. It was a lot more than that. They had to convince the world that Jesus Christ was Lord from the foundation of the earth. They had to convince the world that in the beginning was the word. That he was before the beginning. That he made the beginning. That all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And the word became 
flesh. You go try that. Go on, I challenge you. I challenge you. Try it. And you'll be confronted with having to ask and answer this question. God, what must we do that we might work the works of God? He said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, these signs are going to follow them that believe. So after the Lord had spoken unto them, listen to this now. He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. They working with the Lord. Huh? Who said no out there? Who's preaching at me out there? <laughs> Somebody? No over here too? What, what, what do you mean no? Well, let me go back and check you out now. And they went forth and preached everywhere. And they working with the Lord. A few more knows. Isn't that what it says? What does it say? What does it say? What does it say? Does it say? Why don't you act like it? What must we do, Brother Israel, that we might work the works of God? When you examine the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ, you'll find out there were only two ways in which Jesus Christ worked God's works. Only two ways. One, people came and literally took from Jesus the miracle power. The woman with the issue of blood. Blind Bartimaeus. Even the little Syrophoenician woman. <laughs> this Gentile who was not supposed to get into the Jewish dispensation, so to speak. Snuck in. And Jesus stopped the clock of time and let her in. And God healed, Jesus healed her daughter and then started the clock of time back up again. Second time, time stood still. But there was another great miracle that demonstrates to us the second way in which Jesus worked the works of God. There is no place in the entire word of God where you will ever find that Jesus prayed for a sick person. Never did. Now, it is not wrong to pray for the sick. The Bible admonishes us. Call the elders of the church, anoint them with oil. The prayer of sick, prayer of faith shall heal the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. We are admonished to pray one for another. Confess your sins, then pray one for another that you may be healed. It is right. But we are taking as our parallel of truth now the ministry of Jesus Christ and he never 
prayed for one sick person. You say, Brother Shrill, how did he minister to the sick? One day, he was in the synagogue, and there was a man there who had a withered hand. And Jesus, discerning in the spirit way back there that the man had the withered hand, said to him, stand up, stretch forth thy hand. And the man with the withered hand, now very visible to everybody, under the command of the word of Jesus, brother, that hand began to come out just like that. And it was perfectly healed. A leper came to the master and fell down before him and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. Jesus said, I will. And he went over to him and he massaged his head and he rubbed his back and he began to intercede before the Father for him. Oh, excuse me, I had a vision of you instead of Jesus. <laughs> he looked at the man who was the leper and he said to him, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy departed from him. When Jesus got to his friend's house, Lazarus, he had been detained by the woman with the issue of blood. And when he got there, no, excuse me, Jairus' house, he had been detained by the woman with the issue of blood. And when he got there, there was a bunch of professional mourners already weeping and crying because Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, his daughter was dead. Jesus didn't come to Jairus' house to fail. But you know, he met up with a lot of stiff opposition. And so did Jairus. And so will you. There is no way that you can enter into the realm of the supernatural and have God begin to use you to manifest the supernatural without running into the conflicting forces. You know what Jairus had to face? The first thing he had to face was his religious peers. See, because Jairus was a leader of the synagogue. And his religious peers got a hold of him and said to him, Jairus, what do you mean disgracing your family? You're the ruler of a synagogue and you went out chasing the healer. Shame on you. What a disgrace. Look what you've done to your family. Look what you've done to your children. Your daughter is dead because you ran out and you ran after and you were trusting in the healer. I want to interject this here before we break through 
in the revelation of the ministry of Jesus, which will put the key in your hands to work the works of God right here this morning. You better know how to deal with the negative forces of unbelief. I'll tell you what Romans 3 tells you to do. Here's how to deal with the negative forces of unbelief. I'll tell you what Jesus did when he got to Jerry's house, brother. He turned around and he turned his back on those unbelieving, scoffing, professional mourners. Got a church full of them. And he turned his back on them, brother. And he said, Jairus, just come with me. He said, we came here to do something. He said, don't listen to any of them. Let's go get on with the task. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> don't worry about what anybody says, brother. Just get on with the job. Heal the sick. see him up there? He's in that bedroom, brother. The little girl's lying under the sheet. She's already dead. Puts his hand under the cover, looks over his shoulder. There's Jerry. He says, we came here for this purpose. <laughs> see, Jerry's his heart is in his throat. <laughs> he says, I don't know, Jesus. He says, I sure put my whole reputation on you. <laughs> glory to God. Woo, glory to God. Brother, if you ever put your reputation on Jesus, you don't have to worry. It's when you put it on yourself that you're in trouble. See him with his hand under that sheet. Look at him. Gets the little girl by the hand. He says to her, damsel. That is to say, little girl. Her body is there, but her spirit isn't. It's already left her body. It's already down the corridor of time. Somewhere out here, you hear her. see him at the 
tomb of Lazarus? Oh, we go on all day long. Can you see him? Standing outside the tomb, Martha said, when she ran out to meet him, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said, your brother's going to rise. What do you think I come here for? They told me your brother was sick. I can't help it. If he died before I got here, I still come to heal him. She said, I know in the resurrection, my brother's going to get up. Jesus said, Martha, open your eyes. I am the resurrection. <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. And he that was bound with grave clothes came out of the tomb. Jesus said, cut him loose. <laughs> oh, glory. Hallelujah. Cut him loose. Well, somebody say, just like Lazarus, I am coming forth. Honey, I believe that. I believe that there is something that is rising up in us where we will never be the same again. We are proof producers. Amen. We are coming out of this series as proof producers. And I love Dr. Cirillo. He doesn't just focus in on the positive. No. He wants you to be prepared. He wants me to be prepared. He's so real. Mm. And he says, if you want to be a proof producer, you must learn you must learn to face the negative forces of unbelief. Unbelievable and message, yeah. <laughs> here he taught us just step by step exactly how we can be prepared and be a proof producer and overcome the enemy at every turn. And so what an incredible revelation that God has given us today. And you know, I have seen him. I mean, these are not just things that he is putting on a video or putting in a book. These are things that were keys from his life. If you don't think that Morris Cirillo never encountered negative forces of unbelief, listen, then you don't know who this man is. I tell you, when the anointing of God comes upon your life and you go into a city like London, England, I remember going to Earl's Court with Dr. Cirillo and you begin to proclaim Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, forever, Sick, come and you'll be healed. Crippled, come and you will walk. Blind, come and you will see. You don't think you're gonna get a reaction, but I want you to know something. I watched Brother Cirillo grace under pressure over and over and over, never responding, just like Jesus. Isn't it a good thing to just say, I want somebody to just say, I reacted just like Jesus, and that's what he would do. You would have the demonstrators and the people that would be challenging and saying, prove it. And Brother Srillo would not react. He would not respond. He would let the work speak for itself. I mean, night after night, Earl's Court packed seven, eight nights in a row, 16,000 plus people. The greatest miracle was not the opening of the blind eyes or the crippled walking. We watched it. Charles Spurgeon's granddaughter came into the service with a cane, couldn't walk, and the Spirit of God touched her, and she literally danced all over the stage. But the greatest miracle was the miracle of thousands upon thousands of lives that came out of sin, that came out of the kingdom of darkness, that received the love and the peace and the forgiveness of God. You know, honey, none of that would have been possible if Brother Srillo had taken his energy and tried to engage 
with the negative forces of unbelief. Try to prove himself. Yes, I love what he says. You can't do it intellectually. You can't do it with logic. You have to let the the uh, uh, works provide the proof. That's uh, that's excellent. And that's what he did all of his life. I mean. We're standing in the proof. We are, legacy, absolutely. A lot of negative uh, reactions from a lot of people, but look at this, it's beautiful, the Legacy Center, and so many examples from the Word of God. Mm. So many examples. And one of the greatest examples is the 10 spies who had such a negative report, right. such unbelief. But then you have a Joshua and a Caleb. What yes. a great example. And they had a different spirit in them. And they looked at the bigness of their God, just as Dr. Oh, Cirillo has instructed us to do. And you have a different spirit within you. You are looking at the bigness of your God and you are are turning your back on those forces of unbelief. And then Nehemiah, another great oh, example in the, in the Bible where he was really uh, receiving a lot of negative um, encouragement to quit the work, but he stayed true to the task, Amen. just like Dr. Cirillo encourages us to do. Stay true to the task. Keep focus on what God has called you to. And you know, honey, a great statement that you hear over and over and over again is the anointing that you sow into is the anointing that you receive. And I just want you to know the time that you're taking every day, you're sowing that time into this anointing. Listen, we are not here to be presenters and you be spectators, but we are recipients. We are saying, God, I receive an impartation of that anointing. I want you to do through my life, not only what you did through Mara Cirillo's life, even if God were to just do that, what an incredible life. But I believe that Brother Cirillo would want us to say, God, do double. God, put a double portion of that anointing. Jesus, when he left his disciples, they must have thought, how could this be when he said to them that you're going to do greater works? And I declare that the greater works of God are just on the other side of this valley that you're going through, just on the other side of this season you and I are in right now. You are doing the greatest thing that you can do, and that is making an investment in hearing, receiving, the Word of God. It is spending time in the Word of God. It's spending time on the podcast, on Facebook, on YouTube, and letting the Word work in your life. Yes, what a great experience that we've had. We have received power. We have had a breakthrough in the power of God to produce the proof. And I, I love what Dr. Cirillo says that we need to go past the point of blessing that. into that realm of power and see the manifestation. And that's how we're going to be that end time church that gets raptured in the power of God, the glorious power of God. Amen. So you get ready tomorrow. We're going to be fasting. We're going to be praying, coming into the anointing service, the impartation service. I just believe that God is going to do perhaps something for you and I in a moment of time that may be greater than what we have experienced perhaps in years of our life. That is how the anointing works. That's how the impartation works. So you get yourself ready, get your oil. If you have some oil, doesn't matter, olive oil, whatever it is, it's just a type of the Holy Spirit. It's just a point of contact. We're going to ask God virtually to release that anointing upon you that you so hunger for. And then we're going to be a day or so later taking you into the Platinum Roundtable Review. So make sure that you get your questions in. You must be getting the emails in the email that you receive. Today is an opportunity for you to click on a link and let us know what is the question that you have from the Proof Producers School of Ministry? We'll bring our team together and we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. Father, we thank you today for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you for the gift, Lord, of your servant, Dr. Morris Cirillo. 
Lord, and how his voice speaks to us maybe even louder today than ever before. When Brother Srilo brought this message, the world was four billion people, now eight billion people. Jesus is coming sooner today than he was when this message was first preached. And I want you to know there's an urgency in heaven. The Lord told me to tell you this over your life. God is working overtime behind the scenes. God is not looking for ways to short circuit your destiny. I want you to know God is looking for ways and not just looking, but providing ways, preparing ways to fulfill the greatest version of who he called you to be that this world needs now more than ever before. And so Lord, we thank you for the message of proof producers. We live in a world that wants to see the proof of who you really are. And so God, thank you for the privilege of calling us to be servants alongside the power of the Holy Spirit, alongside one another. And God, we declare that we are not what the devil says we are, but we are what you say we are. And today we're stepping in to our end time destiny. Honey, I'm excited about tomorrow. I can't wait for all of our friends and family to connect for the final day seven. Proof producers, we're gonna have an amazing message, first of all, from Brother Cirillo, but then we're going to go into a special time of prayer an impartation, and I just believe because God is a spirit, that same anointing that I'm feeling right now in this theater is right by your side. And so you don't miss it. On behalf of my beautiful wife, Jerry, honey, maybe there was something that you wanted to... Well, I just wanted to encourage each one of you that you are marching forward. You're not holding the fort. Amen. You're marching forward to even greater victories than you could ever ask or imagine. God has prepared great things for you. Wow. And you're walking in faith and victory. You're wow. leaving fear and doubt and unbelief behind. You're walking in faith and belief and courage. Well, I can't top that. That's the way to go off the program today. Somebody say, I am walking in faith and victory. We love you. We can't wait to see you tomorrow. Remember this, you are a part of God's end time plan. You're walking in faith and victory because God hasn't planned any defeats for you. See you for the great Proof Producer closing session with Dr. Morris Cirillo and then the incredible virtual anointing and impartation service. I believe our lives, our ministries, our families, our future will never be the same again. We'll see you tomorrow live from Legacy in Jesus' name.